Hello everyone. Today we cover versioning. This is a pricing tactic used for offering multiple products into the market. First, from our everyday life, we see that very few firms actually offer a single product. Most firms would offer multiple products into the market. And on the screen, here are a few examples. In a grocery store, we see different types of drinks. And the Toyota offers different car models. And Netflix offers video packages at different resolution. So when companies offer these different prices, usually they intend to achieve different purposes. For example, in the grocery store, we're looking at a situation that is called horizontal differentiation. Here, the products are somewhat similar, but they differ in attributes that allow them to cover people's different preferences. For example, yogurt can have different flavors, and they are all yogurt, and they are usually at the same price level. On the other hand, sometimes the product differentiations lead to products that are vertically differentiated. This is what we call vertical differentiation. For example, these SUVs are of different sizes and different price levels. Here, some products are more premium than the others. Similarly, for Netflix, higher resolution is better than lower resolution. Again, this is an example of a vertical differentiation, when some products are better and other products are worse. At the fundamental level, we're talking about a phenomenon that is called product line design. This can be physical products, or it can be software or some kind of intangible products. Let me first start with an example of physical products for product line design. This is way back, more than 150 years ago. Jules Dupuis. A French economist observed the French rail system in 1949. Here's what he has noted. It is not because the few thousand francs which have to be spent to put a roof over the third-class carriers or to upholster the third-class seats that some company or other has to open carriages with wooden benches. What the company is trying to do is to prevent passengers who pay the second-class fare from traveling third-class. It hits the poor not because it wants to hurt them, but to frighten the rich. And it is again for the same reason that the companies, having proven almost cruel to third-class passengers and mean to the second-class ones, become lavish in dealing with first-class passengers. Having refused the poor what is necessary, they gave the rich what is superfluous. So these short paragraphs describe the fundamental reason for offering different products into the market that is, to target different market segments. And that the products offered have to differ enough in order for the high willingness to pay first-class passengers not to switch down to an inferior product because it is so cheap. Here are some more examples. In 1991, Intel introduced two microprocessors, CPUs. And they have 486DX, which was sold for $588, and 486SX for $333. Interestingly, Intel only designed one chip, the 486DX. And then what Intel did was Intel added an additional line of code to disable the math coprocessor in 486DX and created an inferior product of 486SX. So essentially, these two products are the same physically, and in a way, Intel just destroyed its better product to make a worse product. So why do companies do crazy things like this? Intel is not alone. In 1990, IBM introduced two laser printers, the Model LP, it prints 10 pages per minute. And then there's a second model, LPE, which prints five pages per minute. The PC magazine at that point said, the LPE model is the obvious choice over the HP counterpart. And the faster model, LP, was almost $1,100 more expensive. And what's interesting is inside the printers, these two printers are identical in all physical characteristics. 
The only difference is IBM has added a counter in the LPE model. And the only function that a counter serves is to slow down the printer from 10 pages per minute to 5 pages per minute. Again, that's a crazy thing that IBM has done to destroy its product. A more recent example is Tesla. In 2017, Tesla introduced two Model S electric vehicles. And one version has a battery that operates at 6 kilowatts hours. So that's how much juice the batteries have. And the other version has a battery that operates at 75 kilowatt hours. And the 75 kilowatt model costs $9,000 more. Interestingly, these two models have exactly the same physical battery. And all Tesla did was for the 60 kilowatt hours, Tesla's software actually disabled part of the clusters in the battery. So in all three examples, we have observed companies creating a good products and then destroying part of the function of the products to create an inferior version in the market. Can you think of other examples? You may be using the products without realizing this. Zoom created the premium version and then removed functions. Similarly with other software that you are using, the Windows operating system, the Office software you are using. So this form of product line design is very common in the software business. And sometimes we call this versioning. In versioning, companies offer products in different versions for different market segments. And they design the high-end version first, the full function product, and then remove features to make the low-end version. The profits from versioning depends on both the total value you can create for your customers and the fraction of that value you can extract. I will use a numerical example to go through how versioning can improve profits. So let's say we have a premium accounting software and there are N1 number of accountants and N2 number of casual users in the market. For simplicity, let's assume all the software development costs are sunk. So they're sunk costs, we should not consider them. And for software, generally speaking, the unit variable cost is very low. We assume them to be zero. So suppose the firm has only one product to offer, the premium product. And uh, for the two market segments, accountants are willing to pay $200 for the software and casual users are willing to pay $50. Given the two willing to pay levels, there are two price levels that the company can charge. If we price at $200, the willing to pay of accountants, then only accountants will buy because casual users' willing to pay are lower than $200. So the revenue would be 200 times N1 number of accountants. If we price at $50, both the accountants and casual users will buy, and the total revenue would be 50 times N1 plus N2. That's the total number of customers from both segments. Suppose N1 is 1 million people and N2 is 2 million people. What is the optimal price in this case? So you can do an easy calculation here. If we price at 200, the revenue is 200 times 1 million. That's $200 million. If we price at $50, that is 50 times 3 million in total. That's $150 million. So $200 million is higher. The company should price the premium software at $200 and earn a revenue of $200 million. Now let's consider the scenario with multiple versions available. Again, suppose there are 1 million accountants and 2 million cash users. The company creates a low-end version called Standard. So there are two versions, Premium and Standard. The willingness to pay from the two segments are listed in the table. Accountants are willing to pay $200 for Premium $80 for standard. Casual users are willing to pay $50 for premium and $40 for standard. Notice that the two segments willingness to pay for premium stay the same, 250 
The problem is to choose the optimal prices for the premium and standard version. Premium version at price P1, standard version at price P2. So we choose P1 and P2 such that accountants prefer to buy premium and casual users will have incentive to buy standard. The question is, how do you proceed? It may appear that we can charge the premium version at the price of accountants willing to pay at $200 and standard version at casual users willing to pay of $40. So accountants choose premium, casual users choose standard. So the total profit in this case would be 200 times 1 million accountants plus 40 times 2 million casual users then we have $280 million in total profit or revenue in this case. The question is, would this happen? No. The problem is, the accountant's surplus from the standard version in this case would be equal to their willingness to pay minus the price so it will be $80 minus 40 equals 40. That surplus is higher than their surplus from purchasing the premium version at $200 where they have zero surplus. So in this case, the accountants actually would switch down to the standard version. That's why it doesn't work. Here are the steps we take to solve the problem. First, we set the standard version at low value segments willingness to pay. That is, set P2, the standard version price, at $40. Step two, given that standard version at $40, we want to ensure that accountants will not choose the standard version. We need their surplus to be higher from choosing the premium version. So we must have accountant's surplus from premium is larger than their surplus from standard. That is 200 minus P1 needs to be higher than 80 minus P2, in this case $40. Solving this, we're going to have P1 is less than P2 plus $120. So we set the premium version price at 40 plus 120 equals $160. So the revenue in this case is equal to 159.99 so that's right below $160 for accountants and 40 for cash users and we have a total of 239.99 million dollars this number is higher than the 200 million dollars we receive from a single version of software that's all for versioning thank you I'll see you next time.